Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share God's word with you in just a moment, but uh, before we do, I just want to tell you that uh, we're going to start a, a new series here tonight, and uh, we're going to be studying over the next couple months, we're going to be studying the words of Jesus in Matthew 5 through 7, so we're going to be doing that. And, um, and that's, that's kind of like the easy work because it's all laid out right there and it's Jesus talking to us. We get that. But to intro into all that, God's given me a task that um, is very, very challenging because uh, you know, I've, been, I've been trying all week or so to prepare for this moment right here and still don't really know what to say because he's charged me to do something that is um, based on what I'm going to teach and experience. I know that I and no one could explain this. And so it's super frustrating as a human to try to explain this stuff. But at the same time, while I was preparing, with my frustration also came some rejoicing in that although I was frustrated because I couldn't explain it and craft my words in a way that you'd fully comprehend these truths, I was also excited because while I couldn't explain it, I was rejoicing that this God is so big that it's, He's worthy of worshiping. So like it, 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 it worked both ways, you know? But, I, but what I'm going to share with you tonight, it's just really, it's an intro into our series, but it's super, super important. And, and I know, <laughs> I've, I've probably spent 15 to 20 hours getting ready for this, so no one else in the room is prepared that much for this particular stuff. So I know if I'm frustrated, I can only imagine what it's like for someone who's coming in from a a work week, a work day, and trying to stop and grasp all this, that's difficult. So I'm going to do my best to explain, but we need the Holy Spirit's help. Because where I totally leave off, that's where he's going to have to kick in. Because I, I, I know my limitations. I, I, I know what I have written down. And I know you ain't going to get it with full clarity without his help. So let's take a moment and let's just invite him in to do what he says he's going to do. His word that he inspired says that he's our teacher. That he leads us into all truth. And so Holy Spirit of God, that's what we're asking you to do tonight. We need you, Lord, to, to like, like I just said a moment ago, to, to kick in where I am such at a deficit. I can't possibly uh, introduce the fullness of God to the hearer. I can't do it, Lord. And so we need you to do that. So, Lord, I would ask that you would give us fresh eyes to see you, fresh ears to hear you, and that you'd give us a heart that was soft and teachable. We want to submit ourselves to the holy God of the Bible. That's what we are here to do tonight. So Lord, I would ask that your Holy Spirit would come and do things. I don't even understand how you could do that, Lord. But that's what you do. And so if there's any learning and growing and advancement of your kingdom here tonight that rests solely on your shoulders and you are capable so we just give this evening to you give ourselves to you and ask that you would have your way in here tonight teach us lord so we might worship you well in jesus name amen awesome so so <laughs> Before we jump into our series, I want to welcome everybody that's on Facebook and who's not here in the room, and we welcome you to, 
to join us and grab your Bibles and your friends, whoever you're with, and, and let's spend some time in God's Word. We're so thankful that you're joining us, not just in, in the building, hi Brindley, but uh, elsewhere, and we have people that join us from all over the country, so we just want to welcome you. Of course, uh, I believe that uh, Jay and Marty are watching. Uh, just so you all know, um, Marty's in the hospital, just having some chest pains and stuff like that, so we don't know what it is, but so far the tests have come back good, but we don't know, but she's not with us, and we can definitely sense that they're not here. It's different without them here. Uh, so just want to let you know that you're loved and we're all... You guys want to say hello to Marty? Why don't you just holler out for her? Awesome. And we also uh, want to say hello to Scott, our brother Scott, who's, uh, who's uh, kind of, you know, he's got some hip stuff and some knee stuff and some back, so he's got stuff. And so he's not here either, but we love you as well and can't wait for you to join us back here again. So anyway, um, so, so that second song, I don't know if you all were really paying attention to the second song, you know, um, but that second song by, by Shane and Shane, it's called Psalm 46. And, and, and so, uh, since we carefully select the songs that we're going to sing here, we don't just throw any old songs up there. Hey, that's a good one. No, that's not what we do. And, and we carefully select them. And what we do is, 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 is we listen to the song, we listen to the lyrics, because we, we don't want the songs to be teaching something incorrect, right? So I, I went ahead and I, I spent some time in Psalm 46 this week in preparation of our gathering just to kind of see where these lyrics were coming from. And there was one verse that just jumped out at me. And, and, and I, let me ask you this. How many, how many people in the room have heard that when God speaks, it's a still, small voice? That's how God speaks to people. Go ahead. Raise your hand if that's what you've learned. Nobody's learned that, right? Five people in the whole room. You're all liars. Like, I know you've heard that before. I see you smiling, right? Okay, well, the reason why we, at our church, study the Bible and not someone's vacation or about their dog or their camping trip, we study the Bible because we want to understand who God really is. And although He can speak to you in a still, small voice, that's not the only way He can speak to you. No, in Psalm 46, 6, it says, God's voice thunders and the earth melts. Right? That, that's how, sometimes that's how God speaks to people. That His voice thunders and, and, and the earth melts, right? And, and I believe that that's exactly what should happen every time you go to church. That God's voice would thunder and everything in His presence would melt. Okay, that means fears and doubts and pride and opinion and philosophies and me and you melt. Everything that used to be big gets really, really small in the presence of God. And so... I believe that's what church should be every single time. And we're, we're starting a new series tonight called Red Wall, Red Letter. What's that all mean? Well, we'll explain it to you in a little bit. But I don't want to do what I've done in the past. I recognize an error. And I don't want to do what other churches do. I think there's an error. We get up here and we say we're, we're starting a new teaching series tonight. We're starting a new teaching series this weekend. Well, that's all fine and good, but I think that's an incomplete explanation. Because I don't want it to be just a, to teach I don't want you to just learn some things. I think that it should be a new teaching experience for you. It shouldn't just be a teaching. It should be experiencing, right? Not just preparing for God's power. Not just preparing you for God's presence in some classroom like this, getting ready. No, but that the classroom would turn into the throne room. That you'd come into his presence when you come to church, not just to come to learn so you can be ready for it out there, but that you'd come to the classroom and you'd experience something. God's voice would thunder while you're here and you would melt in his presence. That's what I think should happen in church. So let me tell you what I'm talking about. So two message series ago, I teach a message series called Faithful. And, and I was reading in Faithful this verse in, well, I was reading the story in Genesis chapter 22 about Abraham and Isaac. Remember, Abraham takes Isaac up on the mountain to sacrifice his son. You guys know what I'm talking about, most of you? Okay, if you don't know what I'm talking about, see me or read your Bible. But there's a story in there when he's about to sacrifice his son. And when he's about to sacrifice his son, because God's testing Abraham to see if he's actually loyal to him. He's about to do it, and God says, no, don't do that, and he provides the sacrifice. So there's this ram in, in the thorns. And so 
If you've ever heard anyone refer to God as Jehovah Jireh, you ever hear that, church folks? That means the Lord, our provider, right? We, we, we say God is our provider. He's our, well, that's, where that's, that's where his name started, right there. That's the first time he was called that. That Jehovah Jireh was right there. And what it means is it will be provided on the mountain. That's what it says in that story. And that impacted me. And when I read that, I started teaching through that series, but it hasn't stopped. It's, it started a while ago, but it started this whole new thing for me. And it resulted in a tangible way, and maybe you guys don't even see it. How many people have noticed when you walk into the sanctuary, there's a red wall right there before you walk in? Have you noticed it? Who hasn't noticed it? Raise your hand. That it's red. Okay. There's a red wall right behind that door. And on it, it says, together, let us ascend the mountain of the Lord. That's what it says. And why? Why did, I, why did I put that up there and why is it so important to me? Because that's where it will be provided. What is it? It is everything that you need. Everything that your soul craves is provided on the mountain of the Lord. And so that's why it says it there on the wall. When we gather together, we are to, all of us together, ascend the mountain of of the Lord, because everything you need is provided there. That's where God wants you to be. He wants you to be up with him. And see, a lot of people come to church because they want to hear what the Lord said to the pastor. When all the while, what he wants to do is he wants you to come up the hill and let him talk to you, right? And so therefore, everything that I would say up here would be purely only supplemental to what he has already been saying to you. Don't let me be your teacher. Let him be your teacher. But there's a problem. There's a problem. The problem is this. Psalm 24, 3 says, who, who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? See, there's this, there's this idea that there's this geography involved, like, Abraham goes up there with Isaac, and he's going to go up onto this actual mountain and sacrifice, but then something is provided on the physical mountain. And so we come and we're thinking, okay, geography, well, who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? Psalm 24, 3. Who may stand in his holy place? The, and then it tells us who, who, who can. The one who has clean hands. That means you've never done anything wrong and a pure heart that means you've never had a bad motive and who has not set his mind on what is false that means you've never believed anything wrong do you feel the list shrinking do you feel your permission slip slipping away from you you should and who has listen and who has not sworn deceitfully, which means who does not tell lies. So that means the people who can come up into his holy place, listen, this is not geography, because he's, he was up on top of the mountain for Abraham, right? But wasn't he also in the holy of holies in the temple, behind the curtain? So he's not always hanging out on, on top of the mountain. Don't you know, too, that, that the God of the universe says, I fill the universe with myself? That's the omnipresence of God. He's everywhere at all times. Did you know that? But, but for a lack of better terms, and I'm such a flawed guy, I'll just say that sometimes there's God concentrate. You know, you buy concentrated cleaning liquid, right? And it's really, really, really concentrated. You've got to add water to it because it's even more powerful than normal. Okay, the Holy of Holies, he was more concentrated. On the mountain with Abraham, he was more concentrated. Does that mean he was not at the bottom of the mountain? Yes, he was. But sometimes he's like, there, right? Do you, ever get, you know what I'm talking about? You know he's everywhere, right? But then sometimes, like, you're singing a certain song, and all of a sudden you're like, you feel like he's right here, and you just start weeping, right? I don't understand that, but he's there, he's there, he's there. Concentrated God, if you will. He's not always on top of a mountain. He's in... Listen, anywhere he is, can you go before him? Can you stand before him? Well, if you've never done anything wrong, if you've never thought the wrong thing, if you've never done the wrong thing, oh, and 
if you've never lied about it. So, you, so we give the list and you're like, no, I've never, no, you're a liar. So in other words, nobody can do this. No one can stand. So what I see is I don't see a place where God is. I see position. I also see separation, right? He's holy and perfect. And then there's the list, me and you. So who could come into his presence? Here he is, position, way up high, right? Not necessarily on a physical mount, but here he is, perfect. And who could come up into his presence? Nobody. Isaiah said it well. In Isaiah 6, 1, he said, In the year Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. And he was on a throne. See, that's not geography again. What is that? Positional. And on a throne means singular, right? He's on the throne. That means you're not. That means nothing else is, right? I saw him. He was on a throne, and he was high and lifted up. David said, well, also in Psalm 57, 11, Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over the earth. Again, in Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9, let me read it to you. You've heard this before. He's not talking geography at all. He's talking position. He's talking status. God says, my thoughts are nothing like your thoughts, says the Lord. And my ways are far beyond anything you could imagine. Do you see, how, do you see the separation? Do you see the singularity of God? I am God. This is who I am. For just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways, not geography, my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Not geography at all. John 3.31, the one who comes from above is above all. This is clearly not geography. If you want, you want more, go to John chapter 4. Many of you know this story. This is Jesus Christ He's interacting with this woman, this Samaritan woman at a well. And, and just so you understand, it's not geography where God exists. It's not where we need to go up onto a mountain. Jesus is clear about this in his teaching in John 4, verses 19 through 24. It says this, Sir, the woman said, you must be a prophet. That's, the, that's probably the, the greatest understatement in all of humankind. You must be a prophet. Really? Wow. Where'd you, how'd you figure that out? So since you're a prophet, tell me, why is it that you Jews insist that Jerusalem is the only place of worship? Do you, I, I've never been to Jerusalem, but if you've done any research on Jerusalem, the city of Jerusalem is built on a mountain, right? So why, why is it the Jews believe you've got to go up on that mountain to worship God? That's the place to do it. While we Samaritans claim it is here at Mount Gerizim, where our ancestors worshipped. And Jesus replies, Believe me, dear woman, the time is coming when it will no longer matter whether you worship the Father on this mountain or in Jerusalem, on that mountain. So you Samaritans know very little about the one you worship, while we Jews know all about him. For salvation comes through the Jews. But the time is coming, indeed it is here now. When's it here? Yeah. When true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, the Father is looking for those. He's going to be looking for those when we get done with this message to see who's going to be worshiping Him. just want to let you know, give you the heads up so you're not surprised. The Father is looking for those who will worship Him in that way. For God is spirit, so those who worship Him must worship in spirit and in truth. So obviously, worship and where God is, He's not on a physical mountain. This is status and position okay and and here at revolution church we don't we don't worship the generality of of this ethereal being of you know god see that's a big blanket right because everybody has a different opinion about who and what god is but we don't do that here at our church no we worship god not in generalities but in specifics in the person of jesus christ the Lord, okay? And so I want to show you with clarity that, that, that status and position are, are what we're talking about here, about the mountain of the Lord. Colossians 1.15, it says that the, 
that Christ is the firstborn over all creation. That's Holman Christian standard. But the New Living Translation kind of says it better when it says that he is supreme over all creation. The reason why it's, it's actually more clear is because some would try to fool you, like a Jehovah's Witness would come and try to fool you and, make, and say, hey, look, see, he's firstborn, right? So he's created, right? Well, let me just tell you something. First of all, none of us in this room, who, who thinks that they're stupid? Nobody thinks that they're stupid, right? Okay, was Jesus the first person who was ever born? Yeah, no, not at all, right? And then, as a matter of fact, he wasn't even born, because if you read on in, in, John, in John chapter 1, it says that he, 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 be, he put on flesh and came. He already existed, right? So he, he wasn't, listen, he wasn't first, and he wasn't born. So we need to throw that garbage out the window. He's not born. He's not a creation at all. As a matter of fact, Colossians 15 is followed by what? Colossians 16, where it says that everything was created by him. Right? So he can't be firstborn. It's positional. Firstborn is not when or how, it's who. He's in position. He's higher and better. John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and, mind blow, and he was God. I don't even understand that, so don't ask me to explain it. But it also says that, and all things were created by him. So if we take all these verses, if all things, if everything was created by Jesus, this is where you get involved with the sermon, then he's not the, a creation, he's the creator. Exactly. All that to say this. To ascend the mountain of the Lord is not to put on work boots and strap on your backpack with a tent and climb up some literal pile of dust and rock and grass and stuff, and go up there and, and tr go try to find some oracle of greater wisdom like Yoda in a cave. That, that's not ascending the mountain of the Lord at all. The mountain of the Lord is, is euphemistic. It's, uh, it's parabolic. It, it's, it stands for something, right? It's not a, a real hill. It's not a real mountain. The Bible uses these things to help the finite mind like me, right, understand something that we cannot understand. It's, 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 it's like, okay, here's another one. If you've read your Bible at all, John chapter 15. I'm the vine. This is Jesus, right? I'm the vine, and you're the branches, and my father, the unseen one, is the vine dresser. Okay, so I, I, let me just tell you this. Like, Jesus isn't a plant. I mean, I, newsflash, right? He's not a plant, right? And, 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 his, and the sovereign king of the universe ain't Farmer Brown in overalls walking around with loppers, okay? And I'm looking out at you beautiful people here, and I don't see anyone with leaves growing out of your face. So you're not the branches, at all, okay? So, so is, is he the vine? Of the, no, 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 not, not at all. But Jesus is clearly telling us and how true it really is that he is our source. He is our wisdom. He is our life. He is our breath. He is our provision. He is our power and he is the lifter of our head. And also, apart from him, you can do nothing. And several of us have experienced that when we walk away from Jesus, how our life turns into a living hell. And that's what he's telling us. He's not a vine. You're not a branch. But he uses this to describe some supernatural truth. And much like the vine, the mountain represents something. It's a picture of God up here and every other thing Everything else is down here. Every person, every nation, every religion, every bit of pride, every philosophy, every idea, way down here. It's a position of status 
and, and it's, a, it's, a, it's a picture of position and of holiness and transcendence and smarter and better and bigger and stronger than anyone or anything else. That's the sovereign king of the universe. And I don't understand all that, but until you understand it to a certain extent, you're not going to ever get life. You've got to put him where he belongs. And there's no way for me to describe this to you other than you just got to go after that thing. And the Bible is here for us to try to help simple man and woman to comprehend the incomprehensible. But that's what the Bible is trying to do. And that's why we read it. Here's, here's some awesome pictures for your mind so you can try to understand all this, okay? Isaiah 40, verse 12. I don't know if you, if you have a Bible, please ch check this stuff out. Don't just listen to me, okay? Open your Bible. Open your Bible, Jedi. Killing me, man. There's one in front of you. Isaiah 40, verse 12. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand? <laughs> or with the breadth of his hand, or with his fingers, marked off the heavens? Who has held the dust of the earth in a basket, or weighed the mountains on the scales? How many people go to the beach, right? I don't know how much beach line there is in Florida, but there's a lot of it. And you go out there, we all do it. You go out to the beach, and you stand there in complete awe, don't you? And you go, and listen, that's your little spot. And there's people up and down the entire coastline of every nation on the earth that stand out and look at this ocean and it is massive and you see the waves and they're powerful and we're like oh, and God's like and we look outside at night right and we look out from from right to left and we see on a clear night the stars by the bazillion and you go mind blow right anyone with me and God went like this. Yeah, that one there, and that one there, and that one there. Start to feel really, really small, don't you? And this earth, this precious earth that we fight over, global warming, environment, and this and that, and what are we going to do with it? He calls it dust. And he holds it in a basket. It's almost, it almost sounds demeaning. He's like, this is it's nothing. Nothing. This is who God is. That the universe are but the fringes of his robe. Nothing compared to him. Isaiah 40, verse 22, says, He sits enthroned above the circle of the earth, and it's people, hold up, that means you and me and Trump and Putin and LeBron and Tiger and The Rock and Bill Gates and yes, even Tom Brady are, listen, grasshoppers to him. Nothing. And we idolize these people and we look at the scenes and go, wow! And he's like, you guys stand in awe of all this stuff? I have that in my palm. It says in Isaiah 40, verse 22, he goes that they're all like grasshoppers and he stretches out the heavens like a canopy and spreads them out like a tent to live in. Anyone ever, ever go camping? I know Miss Holly, you just went camping. Now, let's be honest. You went camping. Who struggled to put their tent up and cussed while you did it? Come on, just be honest in church, right? They, they're the worst, right? I hate tents. 
And, they, and the instructions come, and they might as well just, uh, just write, look, it's so easy, you moron, right? Because they make, I think there's someone making fun of us. And we can't put this thing up. It's like this little sticks, and they don't ever match, and it, and it falls down, and you're like, Argh! and then it's raining in on you, and you get so mad, right? And he's like, yeah, you know that sky, that universe that you guys are spending trillions of dollars on trying to, like, like go to Pluto? I spread that out like my tent and go, ah, hang out in it. I imagine it kind of like when we get into the shower and just pull the curtain over. That's how easy it is for him with the heavens. And we stand in awe of all these things that he has in his palm. Presidents and CEOs and, and space and nations and empires and cultures and fame and money and ideology and religion. And it's all dwarfed into insignificance before the sovereign king of the universe. I don't know if this helps at all. But the mountain is, an, is a perfect picture of all this. Because when we gaze upon this massive mountain, we look at it with, with wonder, right? Anyone ever been to the mountains? Has anyone ever seen live like Everest? Has anyone? No? No one's ever seen Everest like in person. You've never been at the base or anything like that, right? But have you been out to the Rocky Mountains, anybody? Right? Appalachian Mountains are kind of like hills, but they're still big. But we stand at the base, right, and we look in wonder. And, and while we're looking at the base, when we're at the base of this mountain, we're looking up at it, there's this sense of, of admiration and fear. Because it's so big, and it's, it's so beautiful, but it's so big and powerful, right? We stand, and isn't that exactly the way we should look at God, but so much more? And that's why in Psalm 24, 3, it says, who can ascend who could possibly stand in the presence of such holiness and power when all of us are but a pebble at the base of Everest? You just see, well, you're, I, I don't know about you, when I even said that, I could just see my, I just, I just want to be down here before him. That's the sovereign king of the universe. The mountain of the Lord isn't a place, it's a position of power and purity and perfection. And who could stand there? Well, according to this psalm, nobody. That's a problem, man. That's a problem, a big problem. So like I said a moment ago, the Bible's filled with all these pictures, all these stories, so you can try to wrap our little brains around these supernatural truths, these realities, all right? So let me give you a reality shot of, of this idea that nobody can stand in front of this holy and perfect God. Nobody can ascend the mountain and come into his presence, whether it's up on a mountain or out on a lake or in the Holy of Holies or right here, anywhere, right? Here's the illustration. In, in Exodus chapter 19, you don't have to go there, but way, 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 way back, what's happened is the, the nation of Israel is, is, is enslaved in, in, this, in Egypt. 400 years, that's a long time, right? 400 years, wicked, total, nasty, evil, brutal, taskmasters, whipping them, beating them, like just, it's awful, right? And God shows up and he brings with him Moses and Moses is dropping God miracles like they're nothing, right? And he's going, he's turning the, the Nile into blood and, and boils and frogs and, and, and gnats and, and slaying the firstborn and all that, right? And so God delivers all of his people after 400 years of, of, of all this bondage and they get out and as they're leaving, they go from totally poverty-stricken and broke to totally wealthy because all of Egypt that they hated started saying, here, you want some gold? Take it. Take everything I have. Just get the heck out of here. So now they're loaded, right? They get delivered and they're rich. And they get out into the desert and here comes Egypt. They change their mind like, what am I doing? I'm not doing this. I got to get those slaves back. What's going to happen to our country? So they come after them. And so all the, the Jews, after 400 years of bondage, and they got delivered, and they're rich, and they should be rejoicing and celebrating and praising them, right? Right? Come on, man. He's listening. His eyes are going back and forth right now. Right? So, so, so they should be rejoicing. But instead, they're like, oh, there's not enough graves in Egypt. Like, you got to bring us out here to die? It would be better to be back in Egypt as a slave than to come out here and croak in the desert. They're complaining. 
And then they're complaining, some more context, then they start complaining about water. Well, we don't have enough water out here. So what does God do? He gives them water out of a rock. Who can do that? Can you do that? Yeah, I didn't think so. So that was awesome, right? So what should they be doing? Look, they should be appreciating that, right? Look at your neighbor and say, you should appreciate that. Tell her. Don't look at me. You should appreciate that, right? God does something for you, you should appreciate that. So then they start complaining more. We don't have enough food. We don't have the right kind of food. Wah! I can make fun of Jewish people because I am. <laughs> <laughs> so what does God do? He gives them manna from heaven. Food that's never been seen before. That's pretty good, right? You can't do that water out of the rock thing. I bet you can't do the manna thing either. He starts bringing, let's just talk, let's just pretend it's like popcorn all over the, flying out of the sky, right? So he started eating that. And then there's quail. Like, I don't, we're in Lake County, so there's probably some hunters in here, right? I don't hunt. But is there a bunch of quail in the desert? No, not really. But there was millions of them that came over their camp. Still, they complain. They should appreciate that. Right? They should appreciate that. So now God's showing up. <laughs> and he shows up, guess where? On a mountain. He's going to come be with his people. And he looks at Moses and he's like, hey, Moses, yeah, don't. See, those people are supposed to be appreciating me and praising me and rejoicing and worshiping me, but they're sitting there misbehaving and they're grumbling and complaining and they're moping and groaning about me. I'm coming, but if you let them come up this mountain, they're dead. Who can ascend the mountain of the Lord? No, because they're sinners. And you can't stand before a holy and perfect God and live. That's the problem. But I know we make fun of the Jewish folks, and I do because I am and all that. But listen, God's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And just because he did that then, don't think that, well, this is the new God. It's the new God of the New Testament, and Jesus is gracious and kind and loving, and he is but he's still the same God. And so that means that all of the people on earth, including myself and you, have the same exact problem that they had in Exodus 19, or 9, or whatever it was. We can't stand before him. Who can ascend? Well, only the ones with a pure heart never had a bad motive, never did a bad thing, never lied. Well, watch this biblical truth unfold here before you. And listen, before I go into this section of our message, this is going to be the place for an amen, okay? I'm, I'm serving it up on a silver platter, okay? This is going to be the place where you begin to rejoice in who God is, okay? See, remember the, the Jewish people that got delivered and rich, and they should have appreciated that, remember that? And they didn't. And then you remember this, those same people that, that were thirsty and got a drink, what should they have done? Appreciated that, right? And what about the people who were hungry and got something to eat? They should have what? Appreciate that. I want to see if you appreciate what God has done. Colossians chapter 1, verse 20. You can go there. Colossians chapter 1, 20 through 22. So, so Paul is outlining who Christ is. And, and, and then it says, after that, all of God was living in Christ, so that means Christ is deity. It says, and through him, God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross, which is good news, but what does that mean for, for me? Okay, here, the claim was that we're all in the same situation as the Jewish people were, right? Who, who can ascend the mountain of the Lord? Those with pure hearts and clean hands and who've never done anything or thought anything wrong. Well, he made peace with you and he brought you back, but this includes you who were once far away from God. You were his enemies. Why would someone be God's enemy? Doesn't he love all people? Aren't we all God's children? Well, it doesn't seem to be that way. I know that's taught widely, but I'm not sure that that's biblical. You were his enemies. Why? You were separated from him by your evil thoughts and actions. 
yet now he has, now he's going to start talking about this reconciliation thing, because it says he reconciled. Well, okay, how did he do this? Yet now he has reconciled you to himself through the death of Christ in his physical body. Here it is. As a result, he has brought you into his own presence, and you are holy and blameless as you stand before him without a single fault. Right? I, don't, no, I, I think you should give him five seconds of praise and worship and appreciation for what he's done. Like that you mean it. Come on now. This is Jesus here, not, right? not a politician on the stage. Clap like you mean it. Right? So, so why would we want to ascend... Why do we want to send the mountain of the Lord anyway? Why would we want to stand and approach? Like, why would we want to stand before this king? Well, we go back to Genesis 22. Because it will be provided. He has your answers. He has your wisdom. He has your provision. He has your comfort. He has your peace. He has your salvation. God is everything that your soul craves. So we should all desire to ascend the mountain of the Lord and come before him with open hands to receive. That's why we go before the Lord. That's where he wants us to be. And that's what should happen every time that we gather. We should ascend the mountain and allow his voice to thunder and that you would melt in his presence. So... We're getting close to the end, but I want you to see something. We're not going to study Matthew 5 yet tonight, but I want you to go there for a moment. Open up your Bible to, to Matthew chapter 5. I want you to take a look. Matthew chapter 5 through Matthew chapter 7 is affectionately known as the Sermon on the Mount, right? That's the Sermon on the Mountain. Okay, that's the whole idea of red letter. Red wall is talking about our wall. Let's ascend the mountain together. And this is going up onto the mountain. Jesus is going up onto the mountain to actually teach. That's red letters. And so it's a, it, what, what we see here in this story, it's a physical display of a spiritual reality. Jesus, the one who was in the beginning, who is above all things, actually takes his disciples up a mountain and teaches them everything they need to know about human flourishing. He gives them what they need. To, at the end of this thing, look at this. At the end of chapter 7, what does it say? When Jesus had finished saying these things, the, the crowds were amazed at his teaching, for he taught with real authority quite unlike the teachers of religious law. He preaches a sermon. So just imagine if, like, I go out of town and up on the billboard out on the street, it says, guest pastor, Jesus. Like, how many people would show up for that, right? Everyone would show up for that one. And that's exactly what this is. Jesus is going to preach a sermon, and we get to listen to it. Notice also it says here, I want to point this out before we learn from it, I want you to see here at the end when, it's, when he says that he, he, they taught with, he taught with such authority, Think about this. They were amazed at his teachers because he taught with real authority. Unlike the religious leaders. Do you understand? Like some people in this room spend a lot of time in the Bible. I've seen some of your Bibles are kind of tore up and there's highlights and papers and stuff. And you read the Bible and you study it. These guys that they're referring to, they're spiritual leaders. They're, 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 they're religious law teachers. Like they memorized the Bible and then they kept every single rule perfectly. And the people are like, but Jesus, who isn't one of those guys, actually teaches with a, a better authority than them? These guys memorized it and, and lived it out perfectly, but yet Jesus had a greater authority than them? Because they're teachers. He's the author. That's the difference, right? The author just showed up into the room. So if Jesus Christ was preaching, you need to come. Because the author of God's word is now in the church preaching. Speaking of authority, Jesus himself says in Matthew 20, this is like the last thing he says to his peeps before he leaves. He says, listen, all authority in heaven 
and in earth, like in all the universe, is mine. I'm the boss of everything. That's what he said. All authority is mine. And what this means is you can't come up with some hybrid religion of your own. You, you can't just say, well, I'll take a little bit of Jesus and a little bit of Allah and a little bit of Vishnu the elephant and Buddhism and Hindu and just kind of whatever works for me. Because he said all authority is his. That means there's no other authority that surpasses his authority. So you can't just add him into the mix. And that's what people, I spent 30 minutes on the phone with a dude today that does this. And he's convinced that he's a Hindu Christian. Really? I'm probably a very bad pastor because I took a picture of an elephant and said, look, it was at Renegers. I said, look, I found Vishnu. I'm bad. He didn't appreciate that at all. Thank you, brother. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, I'm bad. De <laughs> you need to, brother. I got the spiritual gift of sarcasm. It's pretty bad. It's bad. Deuteronomy chapter 6, there's a, probably the most famous of all Jewish prayers. It's called the Shema. I'm going to get a little Hebrew up on you right here. Okay. I didn't know what it meant, but I heard it. I heard people singing it and saying it my whole childhood in, in temple. And this is actually for Bob Solomon, who's not here with us tonight, but I'm hoping he's going to be here tomorrow because this was for him. But this is what it said. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. See, you can't do that, can you? Here's what it means. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. There's no such thing as a hybrid religion that you can add in whatever you want. That means all authority is Jesus Christ. One Lord, one God, all authority, and Jesus Christ is preaching. He's going to be preaching directly to you, providing all that you need on the mountain. And that's what we get to do for the next couple of months, is to listen to him. So as the guys come on back up, and he's going to, listen, they're going to help lead us in worship of this great king, of this sovereign king of the universe. And I'll just say this, I've done the best that I can to describe to you this indescribable God. I don't know how to do it better than I just did. And I know it doesn't even come close to capturing all that he is, but know this. He is here. And we and everything else, I cannot get low enough to describe to you where everything else should be than here. Everything, every idea, every philosophy, every religion, every nation, every empire, every company, every team, every athlete, every superstar, every actor in Hollywood, every great general who ever lived, everything. Nothing. Look at right here in the palm of his hand. That's God. That's Jesus Christ. And that Jesus He's going, to, he's going to meet us right there in Matthew chapter 5, starting in verse 1. And Jesus is going to talk about something we all need. Something we're all looking for. It says it will be provided, right? What he provides is this Greek word, makarios. I don't know exactly how to pronounce it. I'm, that's the best I got. But it means supremely blessed fortunate, well-off, 
and happy. Anybody want to be happy? Isn't that what we all try to do here in our country? Life, liberty, and what? The pursuit of happiness. And the sovereign king of the universe, the one who has all authority, is going to tell you how to be happy. He's going to meet you on the mountain next weekend. He's going to teach you how to be happy. Is that a good deal? I think that's a really good deal. I don't know of any other, I don't know of any other offer I could give you than that. Awesome. Thanks for dealing with a, a flawed messenger just trying to do my very best. Would you guys come to your feet? You know that someday, I don't know when that day is, but someday all knees will bow before Christ and all tongues will confess that He is Lord. And in just a few moments, we're going to have an opportunity to do that now while you're alive. Awesome, right? But before we do that, I'm going to ask, um, we got, got some help right here? Mike? We're going to take communion as a family. I want you to stand because I want you to understand you're in the presence of the sovereign king of the universe. So they're going to pass this thing out. I want you all to take, take the communion elements, and once everybody has them, we're going to take it together as a family. But I want you to take a few moments, and I want you to set your eyes on Christ. The Bible says that we're supposed to set our eyes on Christ, not on anything else. Go ahead, hand, hand them out, hand them out. Like, this is serious vertical time. This is the time we put our eyes on the one who has all authority. And, and maybe while, while we're getting the elements handed out, you could take a few moments and start taking things off the throne of your life. And if you think that maybe your ideas and your philosophies and all that stuff are like supreme, it's time to let Jesus be supreme in your life. So maybe you just need to start thinking about the way you've been living and the way you've been thinking and the things you've been doing. And get off your throne, man. Get off your throne. And once everybody has it, we'll take it together as a family.